without might have relevance to this conference. So if you see the motivation during the talk, fine. If not, you can accost me afterwards. I, I'll tell you because the reasons I have are a little bit. The reasons the reasons I have are a little bit embarrassing. So uh, in public, so. <laughs> Uh, so what I was, <coughs> Jesus, loud. So what I was going to start with is, uh, let me describe. So this this is going to be about three manifolds, compact three manifolds, and let me let me discuss first uh, invariance of M three. Uh, I'm thinking of it as a combinatorial manifold, although, of course, for dimension three, homeomorphism and combinatorial isomorphism are the same concept. But for dimension four, as you know, there's a dramatic distinction between these two concepts, and I'm interested really in things that would ultimately have bearing the dimension four also. So, so I'm thinking of this as invariance of this combinatorial object or smooth object. You know. And uh, so, uh, so. <coughs> So these are invariants which uh, Kinsevich uh, wrote down, and then uh, Bott and Taubes made uh, kind of a complete discussion. And also other names are, in related context, are Singer uh, and uh, Axelrod. They have one joint paper, and then there's one paper, I think, by Axelrod alone. And I'm not going to talk so much about these, though, although there's more of this one. So, uh, so <clears throat> what these invariants are, they, uh, they kind of uh, go back to the Gauss formula for the linking number of two curves to some integral of some expression with x minus y to some power in the denominator that would sort of blow up if the curves came together. So that's why it gives an invariant of disjoint curves. Uh, and <clears throat> there, this discussion also would include invariants of knots and so on, but I'm just going to restrict to the discussion of the invariance of the three manifold itself. Um, and it's really the form of these invariants and not exactly what they do in terms of theorems that I'm intrigued by uh, with. Uh, so I don't really know much about <coughs> uh, what kind of theorems you can prove with these invariants in terms of that are independent from the invariants themselves. Anyway. Uh, so there's two elements in the description of the invariant. We need, we need two elements to get going. <coughs> One thing we need is a uh, trivalent graph. So this is an example of a trivalent graph. Could be, so every, it's a graph and every vertex has three things coming out of it. And then you, you sort of have to close up. <clears throat> Maybe that's a trivalent graph. I don't know. Anyway, you need a trivalent graph. And then, uh, now when you have a trivalent graph, let's see, uh, the number of edges is equal to 3 halves times the number of vertices. <clears throat> Check it in this case, and then it's true in all cases. <laughs> and uh, this is the first ingredient you need. That's this kind of a label for the invariant, or a pre-label for the invariant. And then the second thing you need is a certain two-form on M cross M. And locally, and this is kind of the relationship to the Gauss invariant. Locally, this two form is constructed like this. Let's think of locally uh, near the diagonal in M cross M, we can think of we really have R3 cross R3. 
uh, and then if I take a, uh, so I'm thinking if I take a point here, uh, there's a map if I, away from the diagonal. I can take I have two points in R3 that are not equal, so I can define a map to S2 by x minus y over norm x minus y. So locally, I can define a map in a coordinate system from R3 cross R3 minus the diagonal to S2. And then I can take the volume form, the natural volume form on S2, and I can pull it back. And I get some form, a two form here that's singular along the diagonal. You could do this globally also, using the fact, let's assume the manifold's orientable and then it's parallelizable and then you can write a product structure. Anyway, you can look at page 80 of Durham's book also, about differential forms, the form he has there. Anyway, so that's a two form, omega, <coughs> and then the the, so given these two elements, there's kind of a pairing now. Omega, comma, graph, which is a number. Uh, well, let, me, let me go to the next part, yeah. So there's a there's sort of a pairing, given the choice, there's some choice of this omega, because you, know, you have to choose coordinates to make it. We'll discuss its meaning later, comma, graph, so we get, we get, there's a pairing defined. Uh, and the idea is that you uh, think of the points, you sort of label the, you label the points of the graph by points in M. Um, and then you just form, uh, you take this form and you think of associating uh, to each edge a copy of the form where these two points are like the variables. And then you write an integral, a multiple integral, where the number of factors is the number of vertices. And here you put the product of all these forms over the edges. So the number of factors here is the number of edges. So you just take the wedge product. So you think that in a big product of the manifold, <coughs> on every subproduct corresponding to the, the edge, you have this two form. You just pull that back to the full product. And then you take the wedge product of all these different omega ij's and then you integrate and <clears throat> this is this pairing uh, now there's, there's a, f a lot to check here Could you explain again what, what you mean by the is the two form yeah so uh, yeah. The, the, the two form well, let, let's, let's do this case here first. So I have this two form. So I just really have two coordinates. So now I just write down omega three times. So I'm going to take omega, the integral over m cross m of omega cubed, omega, omega, omega. So think of this like the first coordinate and the second coordinate. But now if I have more coordinates, three, four, I, I think of omega as living on those pair of coordinates and just form this product. How do you know you have the right number of dimensions? I mean, there you go. So this. What was the point of that? Sorry. Forgot to repeat it. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to check. If you actually look at this expression, it's very singular and you have to check that it's integrable. Uh, um, And in fact, the way it's done is you, you, you know, you imagine these labels here are like a bunch of points in M. You know, M1, M2, M3. And then, you know, points, 
points can cluster in various ways. Like they, they, they might, you know, and as they as they start to come together, and then the singularities of these forms will, will, will cause you things to worry about. And the clustering is actually organized by trees. For example, if you have nine points, you could sort of think of that, you know, at one scale, you, you kind of have three. You know, if you, if you got very far away, all the points would look like one point. Then you come closer and you see sort of three points. Then you could go in closer and they might group into two comma one, say. So it might be, you know, might look like that, say. Or it might just, I don't know, it might stay separate. Uh, anyway, so the way things cluster are sort of combinatorially organized by trees. And it turns out there's a, a way to take out all the diagonals and then do a compactification and get a stratification, which is, you can actually, which is labeled by, whose stratum are labeled by trees. And one can, and what was shown by Kinsevich and also Bott and Taub is that these forms actually extend to this compactified thing. And that's part of the proof that the integral makes sense. <coughs> and uh, so that's the first, that's the first thing to check. And then the next thing is, uh, there's a beautiful uh, homological kind of statement. The, I haven't actually said what are the characteristic properties of omega, I will in, in a moment, but uh, imagine you chose a different choice of omega. This has something to do with a homology between the diagonal and a, the Tom class of the diagonal. I'll say in a moment what it, it is more precisely, but it has some meaning. Anyway, you could make other choices and you would get another set of reals, right? The integrals wouldn't be the same, so they're not yet invariants. However, Kinsevich invented this very elegant uh, idea of you take graphs like this and you embed, you have trivalent graphs, and then you have graphs with one four vertex, and then, et cetera, maybe two four vertexes and one five vertex. You, now you imagine graphs you get by collapsing various edges to zero. Then you get more congested graphs, you might say. And you grade them by how many you've collapsed. Okay? And then you take the free abelian group generated by these graphs. And there's a notion of orientation, which I will not go into. It's a very important, however. And, and then you define a... Uh, a boundary operator, and the boundary operator is the boundary of a graph is the sum with appropriate concept of orientation of over the edges of the graph of the, of the graph with the, that edge collapsed. And I've got to put in signs and the orientation, just like you do when you find ordinary homology question of signs, which I won't go into. And <coughs> this is a natural complex. There are many variants of this graph complex is a fascinating topic, uh, actually. Uh, and uh, boundary squared is zero. The whole point of the science is to get this in algebraic topology. That's the master equation, right? Uh, what, oh, this is the microphone. Okay. okay. Don't need that. Let's see. So, uh, and then, so the next statement is, so now we get sort of a function. This pairing with omega is a function to R, so it's a cochain. And uh, the the next statement is that uh, not only do these integrals converge and so on, but this cochain, if you vary omega, varies by a co-boundary. So, for example, if you evaluate it on the cycles in this complex, so if you take linear combinations of graphs so that their boundary is zero, then that number is an invariant of the three-manifold. 
So these are the Ninsevich, Bott, Taubes, and variants. Okay? The modulo, some details, I think, fairly clear. Okay. <clears throat> So, um, right. um, so what can we say about this? So, um, so there's a. It's a. There's this abstract construction of graphs, like a combinatorial construction. So, to each three manifold, you get a co-cycle in this complex. So on the top dimension, so it's a function on the cycles of this complex. So it assigns to each linear combination of graphs whose boundary is zero a number. So all of those numbers. I could, you know, I, I, if I, I should probably, you know, uh, do an example or something, but I'm, that, not, my point is not so much to, you know, present this as a working thing. For me, the, the what is this about is the question. I mean, I'll, I'll grant that this is not identically zero, for example. I know uh, when you do this in knots, you get things like the Ciliaf invariance, and it, there's connections to you know, Jones invariance and so on. So this is a non-trivial discussion, so I don't, although I don't know any one example. I'm trying to understand the meaning of the, so I'm interested in that question. So uh, let me just say, uh, a little more. This, this Gauss formula is, is related to something very classical called the Biot Savoy law, which comes up in uh, you know, electricity and magnetism. And, but for a topologist, it's like on R3, there's a canonical way if you have uh, an exact two form to write it as D of a co closed one form. That's the formula. It's like doing the Hodge theory. So it's, it's an integral. But it, it uh, it comes up in fluid mechanics and electricity and magnetism and, and the omega that's the the operator that that integrate that is the inverse of d is just the omega so omega uh, has is, has some classical uh, meaning and uh, it also has some modern algebraic policy meaning which which we'll get to in a moment and uh, Another, so this, I'm, I'm describing some physics things. I mean, if you don't already know what the Biel Savoy law, I'm not going to stop and say, well, it doesn't matter. But, uh, but and this is even, even vague. There's uh, um, the kind of uh, expressions you get here uh, in these integrals and the kind of singularities are similar to uh, what the physicists get when they do, uh, uh, they write down a Feynman path integral and they, they make an expansion about some classical solution, Va classical vacuum. They make an expansion and certain graphs come in to organize the terms of the expansion. And uh, when you take the mathematical sort of quantum field theory which is associated to uh, the churn simons functional and you expand about the trivial flat connection then I've been told that this, these invariants are equivalent to what you would get. So one new thing is this beautiful idea of Kinsevich that the graph homology is an organizational principle in that calculation. So that's another Anyway, this is a simple thing, but it just happens to have that physics interpretation. So that's... I don't know. It's too hard of a question for me. Let's see. No, maybe it's not. I guess it's the whole expansion. See, I, I don't have just trees here. I have... It's organized by... Yeah. See, the... I, I could have pointed that out. Collapsing doesn't change the Euler characteristic of a graph. Topologists know, know that. So there are, all, there are actually countably many subcomplexes here. And these correspond to the different orders of the expansion in quantum field theory. The Euler characteristic is the natural scale. Okay, yeah. Uh, so that's the quantum of the title, okay? <laughs> that was it. 
no more quantum. Uh, but these, you know, these could be called quantum top, you know, topological invariants that are somehow coming from a quantum theory idea, even though you don't need it to write them down. To sort of, they're part of a bigger story, which uh, we would like to understand. The physicists have a non-rigorous understanding of what this theory is. They call it quantum field theory. So anyway. So Mike, I would like to, first I'd like to understand what this means as a topologist and then maybe that would help me even understand something about quantum field theory. So, okay. Uh, so let's go back and try to start. So then the goal now is to try to start reinterpreting this type of thing uh, just in topological terms. Oh, and there's some interesting point. Oh yeah that the kind of singularities you get in these expressions are only manageable in dimensions three and four. That's another point. If you do this in higher dimensions, uh, it doesn't work. You, have two, you can't resolve the singularities. So what happens in dimension three is the singularities really aren't there. After you compactify, as I said, they go away. In dimension four, Analogous expressions of quantum field theory. I don't know what the analogous topological expressions are, but the expressions of quantum field theory over four dimensional space time just have uh, dx over x singularities in the integral. So they do diverge, but the singularities are very canonical and they can be subtracted off by changing the problem. Because the simple terms in the problem create the same singularities and they can be subtracted off by readjusting or renormalizing those simple terms. And so this algorithm proceeds in dimension four with an extra complication called renormalization, but in the physics world. Okay. Okay, so let's discuss what this... Let's go back to math now. Uh... Yes, I keep. So, um, yeah, so I should get going here. When, when did this start? Quarter of? Hmm? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so now what does the first thing mean? What is, let's, uh, let's, let's see what omega means. This is something that makes sense for every manifold. And, I mean, every, so what it means is kind of the idea like this, is that, uh, um, um, omega is a homology so <clears throat> between the diagonal cycle so we have m cross m so we have the diagonal so let's say it's orientable again right we have the diagonal cycle and a, I'll, I'll use a, a topologist's words, and a, and a Tom class of the diagonal. So there, there's a Poincare dual form of the same dimension, which is closed, the Tom class. And now uh, in this six manifold, a three form and a three cycle can be compared by Poincare duality. A three form can be regarded as a current. And so it can be, it can be thought of as a three dimensional cycle by Poincare duality. And then, then there's a homology between these two. And this homology can be expressed as a differential form. Uh, it's a four dimensional homology, so as a differential form, it's a two dimensional form. So that's what the meaning of omega is. Whatever omega means, it's just this homology between the diagonal and the diffuse version of the diagonal. That's the meaning. Now, <clears throat> this is rather beautiful because there's a theorem of McCrory. It's a, it's a general theorem. I'm going to put together it with a couple of other things and so on. But anyway, the theorem of McCrory says, suppose you have implies Suppose you have just a three-dimensional three-dimensional polyhedron X, which is K 
carries a fundamental cycle so that cells can be orient top cells can be oriented so you have a cycle. Then you look at X cross X and you look at the diagonal. Suppose you can find a cohomology class of dimension three which has the same relationship to the diagonal as this one. You can, it's, you can sort of make a homology of this to a uh, cohomology class which is supported near the diagonal. So you can write that as the formal statement is if you call this thing mu and if you call the fundamental class mu, it's mu cross mu cap u is equal to mu in homology. Okay? That's the statement. Anyway, this makes sense at the level I, I said, but if this, if this class exists and it lives near the diagonal, then this implies that x is a three-manifold. So see, the, the statement that it is a three-manifold is already captured by the beginning moments of the discussion. The singularities disappear if you have this object. No oh, way. lying about something here. Is, is that statement clear? So, so, in other words, the homological relationship I just is expressed, it can actually be expressed without knowing it's a manifold by this equation here. So there, you know, general spaces, there's cap products between homology and cohomology, right, the lower dimension. And the statement is if you can solve this equation for a mu which has a support close enough to the diagonal, then his real theorem is that this is an integral homology manifold. And in dimension three, that means it's a manifold. Dimension four, it doesn't mean that. <laughs> it almost means it, but not quite. Anyway, so, so you would expect then that any invariance of the manifold should be able to be constructed out of this data. Because this, this tells you that it's a manifold. Okay, so that sort of fits with this. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now, uh, well, so, so now certainly this picture uh, with chains and co-chains, this, this aspect of the picture makes, so, so now what I'm gonna try to do is give a, well, uh, what I'm going to try to approach anyway, let me, <clears throat> I'm going to refine this question of what does this mean to try to give a combinatorial description of these invariants. And in the sense of, uh, I, I have a feeling this will help me understand better what they mean. Just like this little discussion was kind of nice. Okay, so let's, well, <coughs> um, th this thing here makes sense. You see, this is a, uh, uh, basically a closed form. You see this, um, you could, you can actually push this U away. This is like evaluating, uh, this is, well this is evaluating uh, a, uh, this is like evaluating a cochain on a cycle. Right, the integral of a form over a cycle, over the ma manifold. We're just evaluating the cochain on the cycle. So this, this step has a combinatorial description. So, uh, I mean, well, we would, we would find, say, a combinatorial analog of, of this omega, and then we would put that in. So we'd find a combinatorial analog And so we, we want to evaluate this on a cycle. 
which is the product m cross m. So that part makes sense. And now we have to put in cut product here instead of wedge product. So that would be, you know, first combinatorial analog. Okay, so uh, so the problem, though, is there's a problem here in that that cut products. We have to be at the cochain level. I mean, these are. I mean, I started to say this was closed. It's not closed. We're at the we're at the level of non-closed objects, so we're not doing something in cohomology. So we have to cut products at the at the at the chain level or at the cell level. Let me put it like that. Uh, and we're working over the reels here, or like over the rationals. So I'm not worried about steam rod uh, operations or something. Can be chosen to be commutative to be graded commutative. In fact, you just take any uh, chain approximation of the diagonal. I should erase that. Write this down here again. So, uh, so when you uh, when you have a space, I'm drawing. This, the real line, because I can't draw m cross m when m is a three manifold. You can't even draw it when it's a two manifold. You can only draw it when it's a one manifold. Anyway, w w the way you define cut products at the cell level is to, is to take the diagonal map in here and you approximate it by a cellular map. And then this gives you a map of chains this way. The chains here are the tensor product of the chains. And on cochains this way, so you have a map from cochains tensor cochains to cochains. So that's a that's an algebra structure. But if you just choose any old chain approximation of the diagonal, it'll be neither commutative nor associative. Now, if you have any choice, you can just symmetrize it and divide by two and so on and make it be commutative. That's that's no problem. So you can always have a commutative cup cochain product. But it turns out there isn't any such formula which is also associative. So uh, I'm going to have to, to make sense of this expression, I'm going to have to put parentheses down. And then I, you know, then I sort of don't know what I should do. Should I just average over the symmetric or average over all choices? Or well, what should I do? I mean, I could just do something like that, but then I wouldn't understand. Uh, that wouldn't have helped me understand stand anything, and then I'd, to justify something I'd have to compute something, which I don't want to do. Um, so, so, so it turns out that it, the next step is to look at this problem kind of universally uh, of seeing what is the real structure of cup product. And then it'll, it'll start to resonate with uh, the combinatorics a little bit of the previous discussion. And that, that'll be the talk, sort of, okay? Uh, so, uh, so how do I get into this now? Okay. So, <clears throat> Yeah, let me, yeah, okay, so let me write this formula here, this choice here, and then maybe symmetrized is called delta. So delta, delta of a cell, DI, is going to be a cell of the same dimension in the tensor product. So it's going to be summation uh, MI, and then you've got to write it out as a JK, EJ, tensor EK. So these e, E's with indices are the names of the cells. Okay, so the, the specific approximation you choose 
is a th this is a finite triangle. I'm, I'm assuming now my man. Let's take a yeah. Sorry. So let's. Uh, sorry, I didn't. I was already. My manifolds are already combinatorial. So I forgot to say. So assume you have a cell decomposition. Any cell decomposition of the manifold. Label the cells E1 through EN. You can use cubes, triangles, tetrahedron, whatever you want. I, I want to have the general thing because I want the product. So I want to use the product cell decomposition here. And so, so the, the thing can be written like that. And then you also have another, the usual matrix, the boundary, I'm going to put a one here for reasons you'll see later. The boundary of a cell is a sum of other cells. So that's M, I, J, uh, E, J. This is the usual boundary operator in the cell complex. So you also have a formula like this, right? Usually it's plus or minus ones too. This matrix is the incidence matrix. Plus or minus ones is the zeros. I'm just calling them M's. So I have these two tensors. Um, so now, any questions? Oh. Okay. Now, this is pretty canonical. This guy here, just you know, choose orientations. This is completely canonical. This is not exactly canonical, uh, although there's a way to make it canonical, but I think that's psychologically bad to say even. But it's sort of, it's something which is defined locally, and any two choices are sort of equivalent in the sense that they're homotopic, locally. And any two homotopies between choices are homotopic. And the symmetric group, as you, you get, you know, there's a lot of symmetry in the discussion, and, and that's there too. So, so somehow one wants to uh, get into the real meaning of the combinatorial analog of wedge. <clears throat> and in, just very intuitively, I've sort of had this feeling for a long time without knowing what it really meant is that, uh, this is part of this embarrassing kind of stuff, is that the, uh, the resolving of the singularities in quantum field theory or in, like in the previous talk it came up multiplying distributions, which is a similar kind of problem. So it was, and, uh, all kinds of nonlinear analogs of that. I've always felt that algebraic topology has already been dealing with this since before World War II in these chain approximations to the diagonal. What you're basically doing is getting off the diagonal where things are finite. But you know, and then there's some difficulty, algebraic difficulty in doing that. But so there's some, algebraic topology is sort of automatically regularizing uh, these kind of issues. But just the structure is a little bit, mis the real meaning of the structure is a little bit mysterious, although there now exist people who understand the meaning of it, so I'll, I'll tell you what I think it means. So I've learned from these people. <clears throat> so, uh, so the, uh, okay, I gotta go faster. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so it turns out what we're going to do is, uh, uh, I got to get rid of these notes, they're slowing me down here. <laughs> I can't think. Uh, okay, so what we do is the following, is that we, uh, we're, we're going to take the EIs to be generators of an algebraic structure in degree each EI is in degree equal to its dimension minus one. And the algebraic structure is like that of a Lie algebra. So they're going to generate, I'm going to, so I'm going to consider expressions EI and then bracket EI, EJ, and then bracket, triple brackets EI, EJ, EK. And I consider all bracket expressions that you can write and uh, the sign convention is vis-a-vis -vis this degree. So uh, uh, in even degree, this is a skew symmetric expression, and in odd degree, it's a symmetric expression. And the Jacobi identity will be assumed, so you impose that, which the way you figure out what the Jacobi identity is, you, you think of this acting on this product as a derivation. You write the Leibniz rule, and if you move a guy across a guy, you put the right sign in. That's the Jacobi identity. It's free modulo that, though. 
And then the uh, this what these uh, people have figured out from algebra, it actually goes back to Gerstenhaber in 63, but there's a long line of names of figuring things out, is that uh, all of this ambiguity here uh, can be organized in a, in a very nice way, like this. So you start defining uh, an operator in this algebraic structure, and it's going to start out with boundary one of, I'm going to say what boundary one of EI plus boundary two of EI. Well, this is, so this is going to be an operator which I'll call boundary EI. Let me just write those two terms here. This is equal to uh, M, M, I, J, E, J. So that's, so boundary one, so let, me, let me not write like that. Let me write like this. I'm going to start writing an operator. A big operator is going to be made out of boundary 1 plus boundary 2. And the first term, the boundary 1 term, is just mijej. So that's from before. And then the second term is going to be mijk. And now I'm going to write it as a bracket. So I'm switching from the tensor notation to the bracket notation. Just a formal switch of notation. But notice that with the shift of minus one here, you lose two before j plus k added up to i. Remember? But now we just take one away from the i, but we take one away each here. So this is, has degree one less, so it's in the right dimension. And uh, let's just consider this here. It turns out that boundary, and <clears throat> there's a, this is a chain approximation. So this operator here commutes with boundary one. It's a chain map. So it commutes with boundary one. So if you, if you study the equation d squared equals zero, you just study it. It's not, that's not a statement. I mean, that's not a, a, a claim. It's just a potential claim. Then you get, oh, and this obviously satisfies, you know, this equation, right? So if you, if you, if you write out d squared equals zero, you're going to get, and then ignore cubic, uh, sorry, fourth order terms, if there were any, I guess there wouldn't be any. Uh, then, uh, oh, sorry, I, I forgot to say something. This is going to be a formula on generators, and this operator that I'm defining will be a derivation. I'm going to, stand, I'm going to extend it to these expressions by the derivation rule. Okay, so I just have to say what it is on generators. So I'm discussing an operator that's partially built for us now. If you study this equation for that operator, now you're going to, since this has got terms like this, after one iteration, you've got to hit it again. You're going to have to use this derivation rule to compute d squared, okay? If you study it, you find three equations. This satisfies the square of zero. This and this are, this is a chain map for this, which is what we have. And then this, which is commutative, satisfies the associative law. Then you can stop the formula if this were associative and you'd have d squared equals zero. So it's exactly equivalent. So you can encode differential algebras that are commutative and associative. You can just encode them into these Lie, free Lie algebras with a boundary operator with two terms. This is called the bar construction, actually. Anyway, it's just, there's a complete equivalence between a commutative associative differential graded algebra and a differential Lie algebra with two terms. So the first term is the boundary operator from before, the second term is the multiplication from before. And I think commutative, it's also graded commutative. Yeah, this is graded commutative. This is graded commutative. It has signs. Before I meant graded commutative with signs also. Okay? Every signs everywhere. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, in our example it won't be associative. So you actually and so, so we kind of we make a little thing. We think of delta one. We think of that as like, I, I picture it, there's one input and kind of one output. And I think of delta 2 schematically as like this, because delta 2, or m, you know, one index goes to two indexes, okay? And now if you, if you do the associative law, this is kind of or, organized by uh, a picture like this. You have to 
take the product and then hit delta to one factor and get three factors, and then hit delta to the other factor and get three factors and see whether they're equal. That would be the associative law written in the covariant way. The dual thing is your usual, you know, the dual map is algebra. The associative law is a map from three things to one thing, an equation, right? But you could, I'm looking at the dual map. So it's organized by this tree. So what happens is that this difference is non-trivial. It's a four variable object. Uh, it's sort of a cycle as a function of four variables, you might say. And because it's, everything is local, the cycle is locally homologous to zero. So there is a chain homotopy between these two maps, locally constructed chain homotopy, which will be a four tensor, and that'll be M, I, J, K, L. So you, you add to the formula uh, plus M, I, J, K, L, E, I, E, J, E, K, E, L. And, and you're going to add this chain homotopy. Now you lose three things here in the grading when you subtract one, but the chain homotopy adds one to boot. And so it turns out this again is in the right degree. It's always nice if things are in the right degree. Uh, and now you look at the, try d squared equals zero again, and now you have to put in, uh, consider the next level of things, and now there are several trees uh, that you can start writing down. And you can use the previous associating homotopy to connect. This, these trees are labels for maps. You start, you take one variable, you apply the diagonal to get two, and then you hit it with the second variable and you get three, and then you hit it in the middle variable to get that. So these, these are labels for various iterates of products, putting the parentheses. Trees are just ways of putting parentheses, right, in expressions. And these two expressions will be related by the previous homotopy, and these two by the previous, previous. This is, and then there'll be kind of a cycle of homotopies, and you get a pentagon, and you want to fill that in by a homotopy of homotopies. That's the Stasha Pentagon. And you want to do this compatibly with the symmetric group and stuff like that. Anyway, and then uh, you get the next term. And it goes like this. Nothing stops you. And you generate this infinite expression. And it's very complicated and so on. And, but it turns out to exactly give you this object which satisfies d squared equals 0. So that's the understanding. So the real product should be thought of as, in, as something, as an operator in the Frehley algebra on the cells shifted down by one dimension. And if you, uh, <coughs> there's a little thing here, if you can write this in a dual, if you want to write this in the dual way where you're using the, instead of the co-product of chains, the product of co-chains, uh, then you would have to sort of talk about just the formally dual picture, dual variables, and that would be a Coley algebra with co-differential, co-derivation. Anyway. Uh, Is this completely canonical given the uh, boundary and the diagonal approximation? I mean, do you make any other choices along the way? Oh, you're making choices, but the idea is that they're all equivalent, locally equivalent. It's, and you can make it canonical using Hodge theory in the cell. It's a local construction. The boundary, the formula for any cell, if you have any cell, the formula lives in the variables generated by the boundary of the cell. So it's local in that very precise sense. Uh, and you can make it canonical by just using Hodge theory over rational coefficients in the homology of a cell. Look, when you solve the equation dx equals y, choose the unique solution so that the co-boundary of x is zero. You can make it canonical if you want. But I don't like that. I'd like to, because I, I want it to be under, so the better idea is that you can generate by any algorithm you want this thing, 
and all of them will sort of be equivalent. In fact, there'll be a statement, in fact, there'll be, actually, there'll be a global isomorphism moving one to the other. But, uh, anyway, uh, whoops, gotta get going here. So anyway, we start seeing uh, trees, and in fact, you, uh, you sort of want to think of this, this object here that you've added as being maybe labeled by this tree. Because this, this homotopy between these two things should be labeled by this tree. So it corresponds to, so the homotopy here, uh, you see to, to get from this tree to this tree, what you do is you take this little edge here and you slide it down and let it run up like that, you see? Take this little branch here and just slide it down and let it run up like that. So at a certain moment there's a degenerate tree which has like that. That's sort of the tree that's in between these two. So all these homotopies are beautifully, this is Boardman's idea from 70, they're beautifully organized by trees where you've collapsed the edges. So it's just like the Kunsevich idea, except that we only have trees. However, it's, it is exactly like the idea that when you study the singularities of this original expression, remember how the points were clustering? Those were trees. So see, I've refound those trees. That's a good sign. So somehow it's the same, they're the same trees. That when you understand that those differential forms geometrically, the topologists, so to speak, have already found that combinatorics. And before the war, let's say. Steenrod is doing this and so on. Doing things like this. So uh, almost time is up. So uh, so anyway, the statement is that this this object exists combinatorially, and it seems to have, it's more elaborate than homology, sort of, uh, it's got all these terms, uh, and sort of this is the, your linear homology, this is your homology with your ring structure, and then there's some higher order stuff, like higher order massive products and so on, it's sort of, but all organized at the cochain level into one operator that satisfies d squared equals zero. And this, this object is pretty formidable because the vertices, which have dimension zero, are in degree minus one. So when you start taking brackets of those, you run off to negative infinity. So this object has got terms running from minus infinity to plus infinity. And it, it, has, it's, it's sort of, it has a lot of geometric uh, juice in it. Uh, so I've sort of been studying this rather feebly, not very vigorously, I'm afraid. But anyway, so it's, it's a uh, kind of an interesting thing. I mean, already the, what this object is for a, a point, if you write it down for a point, the, the algebra is commutative and associative for a point. So you're just going to have two terms here. And you can write it down. And when you write down the formula for the boundary operator, you get the... Um, you get the formula for a flat connection. It's boundary A plus one half A bracket A is zero. So it sort of finds the formula for a flat connection. And when you write it down for an interval, or I could also write it down for a circle, but let's go ahead. It's sort of non-trivial. I'll say in a moment, you get Bernoulli numbers. You get an infinite expression with Bernoulli numbers. Kansevich, uh told me about this a couple years ago. He said there's this amazing formula in the unit interval. I don't know what it means. All these Bernoulli numbers, but it means d squared is zero. Uh, and then a year later he said, oh, that amazing formula is trivial. <laughs> and the reason it's trivial is that he realized that it meant this. And what, which is the fact that it exists is trivial. What it is is maybe a calculation. But so I think that's, I've, actually it took me a year to understand that what his, his remarks corresponded to those things I just said, actually. <laughs> anyway, that's what he must have meant. Uh, I think Bott and Taub have a similar relationship with Kinsevich. They spend a long time and a lot of work understanding what he outlines to them. So, uh, let's see what I was saying. So th this is non-trivial. The thing I like best about this construction is that when you subdivide, like if you, if you go, if you add a, another point, I mean, I should be doing this in dimension three, but I'm drawing this, then 
the obvious chain map, you see this cell goes to this plus this, and so there's an obvious, and then you send brackets to brackets, there's an obvious map from the big construction here to the big construction here, but it won't commute with D. It's obvious because when you subdivide the chain approximations that you choose will look like this, right? So they couldn't possibly commute. However, these two things are homotopic by those. And so in fact, there's a perturbation of the obvious chain map that agrees to first order. You add higher order terms and uh, it will commute on the nose. So these objects actually fit together as you subdivide, but with non-trivial maps. So let me just say what the formula is, for example, I said you had Bernoulli numbers here and it's something like the boundary of E. This is going to be off by one term to write it fast. So it's the i Bernoulli number over i factorial times E bracket E bracket E bracket E i times bracket and then with B minus A where B and A are the, the vertices. And there's plus one, a constant times A which I'm not writing down. That's the formula for boundary E for the unit interval. And if you look at what this E goes to, say, E1 plus E2, when you look at this formula, uh, actually, I haven't proved any of this that I'm saying now. I've just guessed that's what it is by another process. I haven't proved it, but I'm sure it's what it is. Uh, I don't know how to prove things anymore. Uh, Anyway, the, this formula is, we want to say what the chain map is. So E goes to, so the first order is E1 plus E2. That's the obvious chain map. It turns out there's a correction to make it commute with this big operator here. And it's, it's uh, minus a half E1 bracket E2 plus a twelfth E1 bracket E2 bracket E1 and so on. This is the uh, campbell halstor formula for when you take two matrices and you exponentiate them and compose, that's E to a big formula, A plus B plus the commutator plus, right, so I think that's what this chain map is. So already when you study this construction in this trivial case, this is not so trivial though because you know this is where the fundamental group starts coming from and the idea of connection. So it has to be an algebraic model has to be a little complicated. Sorry, so let me just round off now. So that's the end. So, uh, so, so these, the, so this, this kind of a general theorem that there is this combinatorial model. They fit together over subdivisions. It involves combinatorics similar to resolving the diagonal in this differential geometric situation. And as you refine the subdivision, this construction in the dual form, you have to write it in the dual form, in the algebra form, uh, is compatible in a kind of classical limit with differential forms. And when you write down the corresponding construction for differential forms, of course, you're just going to have two terms. It'll be a big infinite dimensional construction. But since wedge product is commutative and associative, you, the, the continuum version of this just has two terms because it's commutative and associative. And, and what happens is that there's a, uh, a scaling that goes on. The linear term scales by, I'll use H for, get back to the quantum topology. This term scales like H inverse. This term scales like H to the zero. This term scales by H and then H squared and so on. So in this limit as H tends to zero, you, you put an a priori bound in to control the boundary operator so this doesn't blow up on you and then these other terms go to zero. So you converge to the continuum. So you see the continuum world as a limit of this discussion so with all this nonlinear structure. But you have to write the continuum world not as differential forms but as this what's called the loop construction of the forms or the bar construction. Omega. So that's not the omega of forms, that's the omega of the loop space in algebra. And uh, use Whitney's theory to make sense of that and so let's see, so I just want, want to qualitative remark. So now you might say, uh, let's see, we look at this. So it starts looking like we're getting there, but we have more graphs here. So the reason I, don't, I, don't, I only have trees is the idea is that the, the next idea is that you, you're going to use Poincaré duality 
to sort of flip the graphs over algebraically. So the idea is that chains evaluated on the cycle, that gives you a, uh, a duality so that the, all the objects sort of flip over. And again, you get more maps. And now you can fit them together. And now you get, <coughs> for every diagram, all kinds, you get all kinds of maps from sets of cochains to sets of cochains. Now there's a, I just want to make a reference, there's a paper by, it's the Stanford Cohen, is Ralph Cohen? Yes. Yeah, Ralph Cohen and his student, but whose name I forget. Let me start to, huh? Betts. Betts, right. B-E-T-T-C? Z. Z. Anyway, they have his thesis and they have a joint paper where they use more theory labeled by graphs and they get a lot more algebraic topology. That has a close relationship to this, I believe. Although what's puzzling is that they seem to be asserting that there's only homotopical information in these invariants. So there's a little puzzle here. But anyway, it's nice to compare that. Uh, so anyway, with Poincaré duality, the graphs become more elaborate and, they, and, and then they can close up and you can get things like this. And yeah, one last thing is, uh, the one, one conceptual thing is when you look in the, the uh, what uh, Bott, Taubes, and Savage do, they only uh, study these singularities down to co-dimension one, essentially. They sh because in some sense, they're only considering these two terms. They only have to do a Stokes theorem argument. So if they have the analysis control, they only have to understand the singularities down to co-dimension one. And there's all this beautiful structure lower that sometimes they don't have to deal with because somehow they're working with this differential forms. But in the, in the combinatorial reassess, assessment of this, I suspect uh, all these stratum are going to come into play in terms of this higher structure you have here. So then there'll be kind of a perfect match between the full combinatoric of one discussion and the other. I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Chain integrals. Uh, yeah, that's a kind of hybrid situation where you use differential forms. I think I think there is a close relationship because I think there is a relationship, but I, I don't understand it yet. I don't understand it, yet, but that's one of my uh, devoirs. I'll see. Anything can be done over integer on the real. Well, um, you have to divide. No, but you can remember. You can divide and remember. I mean, uh, I mean, you do have the integral lattice. For example, I, if you look at, I have an old paper about rational homotopy theory and manifolds. And if you just make an algebraic model, this is for higher dimensional simply connected manifolds. You can make an algebraic model of diffeomorphism types. Uh, your first attempt is to say, well, I'll take the rational homotopy type and then the characteristic classes as a rough model. But then it turns out that won't determine the objects of definite ambiguity. But if you remember the integral lattices in the rational vector spaces that you constructed, then that determines things up to finite ambiguity. So there's, there's, there's a second level where you do the sort of story with denominators, but you sort of remember the natural integral basis. And that'll determine everything up to torsion. That's the picture I have. And then if you're really insisting on the torsion, I can tell you what to do next. And that's what you do. Well, I mean, the idea is that the relationship between uh, a Lie algebra and a group, a nilpotent Lie algebra and a group, there's sort of an integral structure there, but they're different. You have nilpotent discrete groups inside nilpotent Lie groups, and you have lattices in the Lie algebra. So it turns out when you exponentiate the lattice in the group up to the Lie algebra, you roughly get the integral lattice in the Lie algebra, but you have a certain set of congruence conditions. So you have to add those congruence conditions, and then you have a, a true integral representation. But it's kind of complicated. The congruence has come out of all these coefficients. But I mean, that, that's if you're really, you know, desperate 
<laughs> I mean, that's... You, no, no, this is completely a general for all, you know, uh, it's really, for, there, there's really an interesting computation to do like this for every cell. For every cell you have to inductively, you see, if you, if you know the formula for low dimensional cells, then you just fit this, these Lie algebras together because they fit together algebraically to give the boundary of a cell, and then you have to say what the boundary of this cell is there. So for example, the boundary of a cube is some canonical formula. The boundary of the three cube is the sum of six things. It starts off with the six terms, and then there's a quadratic term, cubic term. It's a generalization of the campbell hausdorff formula. I don't know what it is. I don't think anybody knows what it is yet. It's like n categories or something. Uh, but it's a completely general Combinatory. It's combinatorial topology. It's just the full story uh, over the rationals for combinatorial topology. Sort of the full story. I mean, you have to go down and study what the low dimensional stuff means. Uh, you don't, you know, you sort of don't want to describe the fundamental group in a model of algebraic topology because that's undecidable. But you would like to have models that describe all the decidable information. So, because you, you imagine that. Uh, so I'm going on now. That's the part that you have to come and talk to me that's kind of embarrassing to talk about. It gets, sounds crazy. Stop, man. Okay. Okay.